Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Charles Haverhill, and I'm here to talk about Hebraisms and Mandaic. I'd like to begin, just as the study of Mandaic grammar begins, with Theodor Noldeke. In the introduction to his Mandaic grammar, he writes that he has applied particular diligence to the study of Mandaic syntax, because in his opinion it reflects a pure Aramaic syntax without the contaminating influence of Greek or Hebrew. But he notes that Mandaic has borrowed some Hebrew and Jewish Aramaic words, either directly or indirectly. To prove this, he offers us five examples and furnishes an equal number of proper nouns. It was from this point that a kind of commonplace about the alleged purity of Mandaic syntax, and eventually the entire language itself, entered into the scholarly discourse. During the 20s and the 30s of the last century, it became fashionable to argue that everything Mandaeans knew about Hebrew or the Bible was mediated through Syriac or Arabic, and these claims took on a life of their own, appearing in some surprising places. The quote on this slide, extracted from Steve Kaufman's Akkadian Influences on Aramaic, is representative. Given that Steve is focusing upon Akkadian, it's hard to say exactly what his point is. Why would Mandaic have Akkadian words unique to Western Aramaic but not Eastern Aramaic, particularly when all the Akkadian loans he cites in Western Aramaic sources are shared with Eastern Aramaic? It seems like a circular and even gratuitous argument. In fact, it seems like no description of Mandaic should be considered complete without including this disclaimer. In her Encyclopedia Aranica article on the subject, Christa Müller-Kessler informs us that there are no Western Aramaic linguistic traces across the board in Mandaic, and cites Nudica regarding its purity. Müller-Kessler neglects to mention that Nudica restricted his remarks to Mandaic syntax and freely admitted lexical interference from, above all else, Greek and Hebrew, which might very well be characterized as Western influences, particularly in the absence of any consensus concerning such influence, or even a token effort to theorize what that might entail. Perhaps the most emphatic statement comes from Holger Gazella, who completely excludes even the possibility of morphological, syntactic, or lexical interference from Western sources to the exclusion of Eastern varieties. In fact, it seems that with each passing year, the scholarly commonplace grows more comprehensive and more emphatic. Why exactly do these scholars feel obliged to trot it out and expand upon it? In this instance, Kevin Van Bladel provides us with an answer by effectively saying the quiet part out loud. Citing Mula Kessler, who explicitly claims that she does not want to get involved in the debate over Mendian origins while at the same time situating herself directly within that debate by invoking this commonplace, Van Bladel outright rules out Mandaean self-representations concerning a shared Palestinian history with Jews and Christians on explicitly linguistic grounds. The problem with all of these efforts to enlist the tools of historical and comparative linguistics to delegitimize Mandaean religious beliefs, beyond the obvious question of whether this is truly a scholarly endeavor, is simply that few of these or any scholars make any effort to define for us what Western or Palestinian Aramaic is in historical and comparative linguistic terms rather than simply geographic ones. It is this pervasive and deeply rooted scholarly commonplace that the Mandaic language and even lexicon are utterly free of any Palestinian or Western traces that I would like to address today and invite all of you to consider what form such traces or influences might take. Taking a cue from Nodica, where this commonplace first emerged into the discourse, I have searched for the most obvious signs of Western influences in his original formulation, which is to say Greek and Hebrew vocabulary. If we take this commonplace for a scientific hypothesis and not merely a rhetorical strategy, it must be falsifiable. And indeed, one could prove it wrong simply by documenting traces of such influence in Mandaic that are not otherwise common to Eastern Aramaic or Aramaic more broadly. Building upon Nodlika's preliminary list of some 10 or 11 Hebrew loans in the Mandaic, I have generated a fuller list of some 137 lemmas, of which we can bracket nearly half that are proper nouns and a quarter that are likely shared retentions or otherwise doubtful. Finally, a fifth of these terms are very strong candidates for loanwords, and it is upon this last group that I'd like to focus for now. For the moment, I'm identifying these as Hebraisms, but it is useful to explain why exactly what I mean by that term. I define Hebraisms as a specific type of linguistic interference from Jewish languages, and most particularly Hebrew, 
although for the texts and times that we are discussing, we can neither infer nor police a strict linguistic boundary between Hebrew and other languages that we now retrospectively identify as separate and distinct idioms through the filter of historical and comparative linguistics. Cross-linguistically, interference of this sort takes at least five forms. Graphic interference, such as when languages like Jewish, Babylonian, Aramaic employ etymological spellings reflecting the orthography of Hebrew. Phonetic interference, when sounds from the source language are employed in lieu of those of the target language. Grammatical interference, when grammatical features such as derivational or inflectional morphemes are borrowed. Lexical interference, such as loan words, calcs, or loan translations, and other lexicographic gap-filling measures. And finally, syntactic interference, which I shall not discuss today, but which was Nodica's primary concern. The presence of Hebraisms in Jewish Aramaic literatures is hardly unexpected, if only because the entirety of this literature, without exception, is the product of a long and deep scholarly engagement with a particular Hebrew text, or rather, set of texts. The presence of similar Hebraisms in Mandaic cannot be explained quite so easily. Mandaic and Hebrew do not share a script, let alone anything resembling a literary canon, and there is no reason to attribute to Mandaean authors any level of engagement with the Hebrew language. One might attribute their presence to contact with Jewish speakers of Aramaic, and undoubtedly this is the case in some instances, but I think you'll find from the data I present here that what we find contradicts much of how we understand the mechanisms of borrowing. The languages of the square script literature are obviously jargons, and most certainly not representative of the sort of speech that their authors might use across all sociolinguistic domains, because it would almost certainly impede comprehension rather than enhance it. The problem with identifying this kind of interference from Hebrew upon Aramaic is that the two languages come from the same proximate source, are in fact quite similar, and have had such sustained contact over the course of millennia that it is sometimes difficult to disambiguate the two. Therefore, I'll be employing four tools today. Referential identity, that is, those of the same unique notional reference, whether they exist in the real world or some shared imaginary. Isolated nouns that are first attested in Hebrew and also found in Mandaic, and not likely shared retentions from some common ancestor, or nouns and verbs deriving from roots that are fully productive in Hebrew, but not Aramaic. Those that come from cognate roots that are productive in both languages, but have undergone some semantic drift unique to Hebrew. And then finally, those that are cognate and productive in both languages, but which have undergone innovative phonetic shifts in one or the other language that make them easily identifiable as belonging to one branch or the other of Northwest Semitic. So let's start with referential identity, that is, loanwords describing unique reference either from the history of Hebrew speakers or from their literary imaginary. Describing these as loanwords might seem a rather anodyne observation, but it allows me to illustrate just how pervasive these various forms of linguistic interference really are. To my first point, referential identity, we can assume that proper nouns referring to unique individuals are borrowed, although whether such names are assimilated to the phonology of Mandaic or reflect the phonology of Hebrew varies considerably. While Hebrew and Mandaic do not share a common script and therefore lack opportunities for graphic interference, there are some interesting exceptions. The well-known genius Yusmir, whose name probably reflects the Hebrew divine name in the purely Aramaic passive participle, Samir, guarded, observed, kept, appears in an entry in a Mandaic dictionary as Yushmir, with a Hebrew reflex of the same root, just as it occasionally does in Jewish Babylonian Aramaic. Although the authors cite a Mandaean phylactery, this is in fact a ghost entry, as Matthew Morgenstern has confirmed to me in a personal communication. Evidence of phonetic interference, on the other hand, is especially widespread, as many proper nouns reflect the Canaanite shift of historical a ah to historical o. Oh. Examples of grammatical interference are fewer and further between, but there is one extremely productive suffix, il, which is used to transform practically every verb or noun into the name of an angel. This is probably on the analogy of well-known names such as the biblical Gabriel or the figure of Soriel from the apocryphal book of Enoch, whom Mandaeans identify with the moon god Sin and with the angel of death simultaneously. The other names, like Iftahil, are unique to Mandaism. 
Finally, in the area of lexical interference, I'll start with the term afike mayim, which refers specifically to the channels through which the heavenly yardni descend to the material world from the light worlds, and through which souls pass in the opposite direction after their purification in the purgatories. The word absolutely does not mean streams, as in the afke of Syriac, nor is it used in any context other than this narrowly cosmological one. It just means these channels in the firmament and nothing else. The Hebrew root of Mandaic kafiki and Syriac afke, afek, is productive in the heat pile stem with meanings of force oneself or restrain oneself. The base meaning seems to be one of holding or restraining. In any case, it is not productive in these other languages, which provides us with a clue as to the directionality of the borrowing. Regardless of whether it was attested in Hebrew or Aramaic first, and it seems obvious to me that it was attested first in Hebrew, the fact that these words are enmeshed in a complex lexical web of verbs and substantives in Hebrew, that they completely lack in Aramaic, and that they have a much broader reference in Hebrew than in Aramaic, is a strong indication that Hebrew is in fact their source. On the other hand, when we absolutely cannot associate an isolated noun with a root, or reconstruct a productive root from other languages, we either have to assume that one language borrowed from the other, or that they represent retentions from some ancestor that survived seemingly only in Hebrew and Mandaic, which seems unlikely on the face of it. We can exclude this possibility on logical grounds. So, for example, we can confidently ascribe Ezekiel's wheels, or Ophanim, and Jewish phylacteries, or Totafot, to Hebrew origins. Other words are not so obvious. Take, for example, the word Yona, which refers to the earth and which Noldica confidently derives from Ionia, inferring that an Ionian world would necessarily be one that was skillfully constructed because the Greeks did these things well. This interpretation is wholly at odds with the surrounding context in which the creation of the world is uniformly described as a bad thing. And instead, I would argue that it reflects the Hebrew word Yahvein, as in Psalm 40 and 69. That makes it the sole attestation of this isolated noun in Aramaic, or indeed anywhere else outside of Hebrew. To give you another example in the great treasure, the phrase porari et pieno, the porari of the evening, parallels to lali et sofro, the shadows of the morning, and it seemingly refers to dusk or twilight. The only obvious etymological candidate is Hebrew pohor, which appears twice in the phrase kipsu pohor, which probably means something like their faces gathered soot, or more succinctly, they became black-faced, which is to say, metaphorically anguished, not literally like the Canadian Prime Minister. Like Yavin, Purari appears uniquely in Mandaic, not anywhere else in Aramaic. Our last example, likely from Hebrew Karka, also appears in Samaritan and languages employing the square script, but not Syriac. Similarly, we have a handful of words from roots that are attested and productive in Hebrew, but not Aramaic, such as Uro, which is light, and perhaps the source of the name Ur, Otari, which is a uh, circlet, it parallels the word Klila in the book of John, and Zido, or rage. These can be found in other languages employing the square script, but their Hebrew origins are undisputed. Another telltale diagnostic for borrowing is when a common word appears in an unexpected and restricted meaning reflecting semantic interference from some other source. That is to say, a word already exists in these languages, but one language borrows it in a new meaning from the other one. This is the case with three Mandaic roots, Ithegdel, or Ethgadel, Ethgamel, and Hakkar. The first obviously recalls Hebrew Hikadel, meaning to magnify oneself, but just about every other cognate refers to some form of twisting or intertwining. The semantic drift from entwine to grow larger presumably, like a yarn ball, is seemingly unique to Hebrew and Mandaic alone, with the exception of the Ugaritic cognate, and it suggests interference from one upon the other. Mandaic Ethgamel, to be weaned, which appears in one context for the angel of death, Sovriel, strips the reluctant soul from the breast of its corpse, recalls Hebrew Nigmal, to be weaned, but the cognates and other languages for this root have nothing to do with this meaning, as you can see. Again, the shift from do the appropriate thing to accustom someone to managing without something on which they have become dependent or of which they have become excessively fond occurs in Hebrew and Mandaic alone. Finally, hakkar, 
study, investigate, recalls Hebrew hakar, search, but in just about every other language this root appears, it has to do with overweening pride. Now, I, for one, can't even begin to imagine how research has anything to do with boasting, disdain, and overweening pride. There are, of course, plenty of examples of existing words gaining new meanings as a result of interference. The word kono, which simply means priest elsewhere, takes on the meaning of a specifically Jewish priest in Mandaic. Similarly, the word makafto does not normally mean ship or chariot in Mandaic, as it does elsewhere, except in the sense that is normally followed by the words of the gods, perhaps in dialogue with the vision of Ezekiel. The word maskeloni appears only in the context of wordplay, for which Mandaeans are infamous. According to the great treasure, Jews, or yohotoi, are so called because they sin, or hoton, in Mandaic, and they call themselves maskilim because they are foolish, or askel. The presence here of the action noun nimra, which normally means speech or discourse, may surprise you, but there are several contexts in Mandaic literature in which it replaces the usual word menelfa in a very restricted sense, specifically in reference to divine proclamations or even the divine logos. Similarly, the word karno, which otherwise always means horn, once appears in the book of John to describe the beams of light, or karne etziwo, that shine from the head of the light world messenger. This word also appears in this meaning uniquely in two contexts in Hebrew. Habakkuk 3.4 and Exodus 34.29, both of which are paraphrased in all the Aramaic translations except for the Samaritan Targum, which preserves the original root in the latter sense. That verse, incidentally, is responsible for the belief, formerly widespread in Europe, that Jews have horns, as famously reflected by Michelangelo's statue of Moses. Last but not least, the word sarufi, which should mean something like swallowers in any Aramaic dialect, is applied to the seven entities with whom the light world being Shishlam Rabo has entrusted the governance of the material world, and clearly parallels Hebrew Seraphim in this specific context. Of, of course, it must be admitted that some of these examples are somewhat subjective, but not entirely falsifiable. For example, a cognate word in two different languages could theoretically converge independently one of one another through semantic drift. The gold standard for identifying loanwords is the presence of phonemic innovations such as mergers or splits in either the source or the target language, which help to disambiguate similar roots. If we assume that sound changes are regular and without exception, then the otherwise inexplicable retention of a phoneme where it is otherwise merged with another phoneme is potential evidence of linguistic interference. So, for example, we find here three Mandaic roots, sabat, grab jointly, sahak, to rejoice or sport, and soyas, to be runny or watery, which is a set of eyes. The first resembles a Hebrew word used in the root for bundles, svatim. But the Mandaic biform, abat, warns us that we're in for some trouble. Indeed, based upon the cognates in other languages, the initial radical should be a glottal stop reflecting a historical ein not a tzadi. Similarly, sahak corresponds precisely to Hebrew tzahak and sahak, and it has not one but two biforms, ahach and gahach. Based upon the cognates, the former is the form we'd expect. The third root has a complicated etymology, but ultimately it would appear to be key, uh, cognate with Hebrew yatsa, and the expected Mandaic root would be something like Syriac ya, or ia, albeit even more weak, with a medial aleph. In all three of these examples, one would not expect tzadi, as in Hebrew, but rather ein, as in the other forms of Aramaic, or the glottal stop in Mandaic. I could illustrate this point further with two or three very similar roots in Mandaic, the relationship between which is not immediately obvious until we revisit the cognates in other languages. Komas is an extremely productive root that Mandaeans deploy across a wide variety of cosmogonic settings, both as an action and a place. Although the semantics of this verb evidently reflect a unique development within this language, it appears to be cognate with Hebrew kamatz and Akkadian kamatsu. There is only one problem. There are a whole host of evident cognates in Syriac, JBA, and possibly Arabic in Gaz, 
in which the final radical is a ta, not a, a, a tzadi. And in fact, an obvious reflex of that very root appears in Mandaic as gamat. The same is true for the second form on the slide, in which we would expect something like the Syriac and JBA forms rather than the Hebrew form. Obviously, there is some contamination between these two roots, particularly in the languages in which they have fallen together, but the important thing to take away from this slide is that the third radical of both roots is completely unexpected. If nothing else, these Mandaic forms and biforms stand as reminders that, for all of its innovative phonology, Mandaic nonetheless serves as a treasury of some truly ancient forms that are lacking elsewhere in Aramaic. I'll conclude here by returning to our original scholarly commonplace, that the Mandaic language is utterly free of any Western or Palestinian traces, whatever that may mean. Despite appearing in one form or another as standard boilerplate in most recent treatments of the subject, this is one hot mess of an argument. Regardless of how we want to define Western and Palestinian here, which is a big part of the problem, it suffers from the same defect as any argument from ignorance. It excludes the possibility that there may have been an insufficient investigation to prove that its proposition is either true or false. Can this claim be salvaged in a stronger form? I think that all these scholars would agree that we can assign Mandaic to the eastern branch of Aramaic languages attested in late antiquity on the basis of certain specific grammatical features, chiefly shared innovations in the morpholexicon. Even if they do not, this is a focused, specific claim that is subject to debate. It is, however, emphatically not the same as the claim they are making. Similarly, I would even be willing to return to the original claim of Nuldika, whose authority they invoke in this connection, namely that Mandaic syntax shows the least evidence of Hebrew and Greek interference, and therefore represents a kind of purer syntax than the languages that do. While I do not necessarily agree with this claim, it is at least focused, specific, and subject to investigation. It is also, again, not the claim that they are making. One might reasonably ask why such good scholars trot such a weak claim out with such frequency. I have my suspicions. Just as it suffers from the obvious defects of an argument from ignorance, it benefits from the rhetorical strengths of an appeal to purity. This is especially evident in some of its formulations, such as those of Müller, Kessler, and Gazella, which defensively speak of unconvincing or ambiguous counterexamples without actually naming any, demonstrating that they are well aware of the potential deficiencies of the claim, but that they are nonetheless committed to retaining it in its weakest form, without the need to consider any contrary evidence. This is not a bug, it's a feature. It tells the reader, I've heard enough and I've made up my mind, so don't try to bother me with the facts. Ultimately, this is not a linguistic claim about the affiliation of Mandaic. It is a historical argument that attempts to marshal linguistic evidence to its defense, and it does quite a pure job at both historiography and linguistics. That being the case, perhaps the argument that we should be trying to address is not the linguistic argument about the affiliation of Mandaic, on which we're all pretty much in agreement, but rather the historical argument about Mandaeans, their retrospective recognition of themselves in the community of John the Baptist, and of a shared Palestinian history with Jews, all of which these scholars deny them for one reason or another. The fact that several of these Hebraisms are absent even from Samaritan Aramaic and the square script languages suggest a deeper, more sustained, and ultimately unmediated engagement with speakers of Hebrew that has previously been acknowledged, independent of any specific time or place, although this is once again an argument from ignorance. At a minimum, the sheer number of Hebraisms should stimulate us to reconsider the value of Mandaic for the study of Northwest Semitic lexicography, as well as revisit some of our older assumptions concerning the Mandaean engagement with Jews and with Jewish sources. Thank you.